Hi, I'm Bill Kinney, and this is my first uh, relatively long lecture about financial mathematics for actuarial science. I'm giving these lectures at Bethel University for consumption in my courses. And, um, well, you know, these lectures that I'm going to do will be hopefully about an hour, and will cover a lot of content from a broad perspective. I'm using the sixth edition of the Mathematics of Investment and Credit by Samuel Broberman for this class which you want to get, and you also would want to get a solutions manual for it. I'm off, also often going to use the theory of interest by Stephen Kellison as a reference. This is the second edition. It's about 12 years old. There's probably newer editions right now. Again, these are going to be a broad perspective on things, an overview of the chapters. I'm trying to do all of chapter one, essentially, in one one-hour lecture here. If you want help with problem solving, you should look down in the description of this video, and I will have links to some problem solving videos. I've got lots of them that are typically 7 to 13 minutes going over problems in Broberman's book. So you need to get practice with those problems if you're really going to get this. Again, these lectures are for a big perspective on things. So lecture one, you can see in the title there, is about financial quantities for representing growth and decay, especially exponential growth and exponential decay. So we're going to talk about uh, how, how do we represent these kinds of quantities, especially in finance. Um, again, from a broad perspective, I will mention real life practical realities from time to time, but you're really going to get more of those from reading the book. You're going to talk about, the book talks about things like treasury bills and bonds and that kind of thing. It gets into those kinds of details. I'm going to focus more on the math in these lectures. But there's a basic reality. The most fundamental fact in finance is that money has what's called a time value, also known as the time value of money. You may have heard of this before, thinking about putting money in your savings account. You get interest, your money grows, so to speak. But the idea of the time value of money is broader than that. It arises from the basic reality that most people would prefer a dollar or a pound or a euro or whatever right now, at this instant, than a dollar in the future like one year from now, right? What are the causes of this? Well, psychology slash personality is in people's greed. They want to have their money right now. They can't control themselves. They need to go buy something with it right away. There is also something called opportunity cost, meaning um, they could take this dollar today and invest it. They could make money off their money. They could also buy things with it that would help them start a business. That's called opportunity cost. There's also inflation. The value of your money goes down over time. People typically think of that as the price of things that you buy go up over time. And so you want to get uh, the money right now so that you can buy what you need right away. There's also this idea, at least in America, of keeping up with the Joneses, uh, meaning your average next door neighbor, you see that they buy a nice, or they have a nice house, or they, they go buy a boat or a nice car, and you want to do the same thing. You want to keep up with them. You have one life to live, etc. There are lots of possible causes for this idea of the time value of money. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to model this, not just with savings accounts, but in lots of, lots of situations. A uh, blast from the past, I, I hope you've seen formulas for simple interest and compound interest before. Maybe you've seen these formulas for simple interest. I, which is the amount of interest that you earn, is P times R times T, P being the principal, R being the interest rate, typically given as an annual rate, maybe 10, well, maybe 2% per year or something like that, like that, and T is time, maybe in years. And the accumulated or future value of your money is the original principal, the deposit, plus the interest which can be simplified to that expression. And then there's the formula for compound interest, um, which looks like this. Take your principal and multiply it by this expression, 1 plus the interest rate, divided by the number of compounding periods per year, raised to n times t, where again, n is the number of compounding periods per year, times t is the number of years that go by, to get the future accumulated value in the account. And if you want to figure out the interest, then use this formula. So maybe you've seen this before, and this is certainly something we're going to talk about in this lecture and throughout this class in financial math for actuarial science. Though we will mostly talk about compound interest, and we will actually use different notation for the most part than what you see here. And when you're comparing 
simple interest versus compound interest, look back at those formulas, thinking of these things as functions of t, it's really linear growth versus exponential growth. That's a linear function of t. This is an exponential function of t. I hope you remember from algebra and or pre-calculus that linear growth has a constant rate of change or slope, whereas exponential growth, maybe you're less likely to, likely to know this, has a constant relative rate of change. For a given change in time, delta t represents the change in time, what do the graphs look like? For linear growth, the graph is a straight line, and you see that the rise of a run is constant. The change in the amount, delta a, divided by the change in time, delta t, this quotient here stays constant no matter where you are on the curve. Take the rise of a run, given any two distinct points on this straight line, you look at the same slope. That's also called the rate of change. With exponential functions, it's a little bit more subtle. It's the change in the amount divided by the starting amount. Think of A of T as being the starting amount during a certain interval of time. So T here looks like it's about 1.6. That's the starting moment in time that we're thinking about here. We're letting T increase from about 1.6 up to 6, so it increases by 4.4. That's delta t. Delta a, the change in a, which is this distance right there, divided by a of t, which is this distance right here, also this distance right there, is constant for a given delta t, this given delta t of being about 4.4. If I move this back and forth for that given delta t, that ratio, this distance divided by this one, will stay constant. I actually have a Mathematica animation for this. Let's see here. Uh, I have to exit. Sorry about this. There we go. Mathematica is a program that I use a lot to make animations. And this illustrates how the slope stays constant for linear growth. I can change the starting location. I can also change delta t. And no matter what happens with this particular line, the uh, triangle is similar no matter what, and you have the same slope. Whereas with exponential growth, again, the ratio of this distance to that distance will stay constant. I'm not going to take the time to check that with my calculator. You might want to pause the video and try to estimate these distances for that particular uh, starting value of A, which is now about 2.7 or so. And maybe I'll change A. And you can try calculating the ratio of this divided by that for this new starting value of A, which is the starting value of T right there, and see that you get about the same thing. You can change delta T and you get different ratios, but for any fixed delta T, the ratio for different A's, different starting times really, I probably shouldn't have called it A, different starting times stays the same for a fixed delta T. Okay, so that's linear versus exponential growth. What's about actuarial notation for all this and compound interest at least? This terminology is important too. The future or accumulated value at a time t of a payment or a deposit of one, one dollar, one euro, one pound, whatever, at time zero is given by this expression right here. And actually, there are times when we don't even write it like you see here. But let me just go ahead and write it like that. What do these symbols represent? Well, first of all, there is a 1 here, a deposit of 1 that's in front of this that we don't bother writing, since when you multiply by 1, it doesn't change it. I n would be the interest rate compounded n times per year. So oftentimes, n might be 4 if it's a quarterly interest rate. N might be 12 if it's compounded monthly. N is the number of compounding periods per year. Let's just pretend time is in years. Again, that's the same thing up there. And T is the amount of time in years. Don't get confused. We're not doing complex analysis here. That's not the imaginary unit. That's not square root of negative 1. No imaginary numbers in here. I stands for the interest rate. This is often called a nominal rate. So if I wrote i12, and by the way, the n is not a power here either. I'm not raising i to the 12th power. It's indicating that this is a 
nominal interest rate compounded 12 times per year. If, for example, it was 4%, 0 0.04, that would mean that that is the nominal in name only interest rate compounded 12 times a year. Which means the corresponding monthly interest rate would be that thing divided by 12, and that would be 0.3 repeating percent, one third of a percent per month. That's how much your money would grow every month if it's a 4% nominal rate per year compounded monthly. It grows by that percentage every month, which actually we will see makes it grow more than 4% over the entire year. That's the so-called magic of compound interest. Something else should be mentioned about this. N times T, N is the number of compounding periods per year, say T is the number of years, also can be thought of as just representing the number of times you compound interest over those t years. So for example, if n is 12 and t is 2, n times t would be 24. You'd compound interest 24 times over two years. If the payment of time 0 is something other than 1, call it a sub 0, then capital A of t is often used for the future value of the situation, and you just multiply little a of t by a sub 0 to get that future value of that initial deposit if it's something other than 1. But we often work with a little a of t. We often think about amounts of 1 instead of arbitrary amounts in a lot of the problems that we do. Here's a technicality that can often be ignored, though not always. As stated, the equations in the previous slide are only true when n times t is a whole number. And in reality, the graph of a of t is piecewise constant. The blue horizontal lines here make up the true graph of A of t, you're only getting interest if it's compounded, say, monthly, at the end of every month. That's when you get the jumps in the amount. We're not depositing any more than just the first amount. If it was quarterly, once every three months, you'd get the jumps uh, at time 3, 6, 9, 12, etc. if time was in months. Um, and if time were in years, you'd get those jumps at um, time 1 fourth, 1 half, 3 fourths, and 1, etc. Uh, this technicality can often be ignored, and we will often ignore it and not worry about it, but there are some situations where you have to pay attention to it. Here is an essential, and I really do mean essential, this is really important, point of view for problem solving. It's the creation of timelines, number lines, where you mark off amounts of money and times. Given an amount of money, A, valued at a time T1, and some other time, T2, that's in the future, say, we can promote or push A forward. And I literally think in terms of physical pushing. I, like, I take that amount of money and I push it forward from time 1 to an equivalent value at time 2 by multiplying by a ratio. Take A and multiply it by this ratio, little a of T2 divided by little a of T1. And you can visualize it on a number line like that. So you got a number line, your timeline, here's time T1, here's time T2. You've got this amount A at time T1. What's its future or accumulated value under this interest regime where compound interest or maybe something else more complicated is going on? What is that future value? Take A and multiply it by this ratio. Now oftentimes T1 is taken to be zero. And a of 0, little a of 0, is 1. And therefore, this fraction simplifies to little a of t divided by little a of 0, which would be little a of t divided by 1, which would just be little a of t. And so we take our amount at time 0 and find its future value by multiplying by little a of t. So it often simplifies to that. But in general, you want to think of it as being multiplied by this ratio, at least if t1 is not 0. And I suppose if you were thinking about a situation where this was not one, though that is the typical way people think about little a, then you'd want to think about that ratio too. What happens in the case of compound interest? The ratio simplifies by properties of exponents, right? Little a of t2 divided by little a of t1, if we're using compound interest, let's keep it simple, we'll take n to be 1 here. We get 
1 plus i to the t2 power divided by 1 plus i to the t1 power, and you'd subtract those exponents like you see here, a property of exponents. And so you really can just do a, a multiplication is the, is the upshot of that. On the other hand, if you were doing simple interest, which actually, to tell you the truth, we rarely think about um, in a lot of the problems in chapter one, then it becomes that and it doesn't really simplify much. Okay? So that would be what happens if you're doing compound interest or simple interest. But again, there, I mean, this is, these are the main models, simple interest and compound interest, but we will consider more complicated situations, including in this lecture, we will look at a more complicated situation. Um, so interest can be compounded in various ways. You could compound quarterly, you could compound monthly, you could compound semi-annually, which would be twice a year, or annually once a year. You could compound daily. So n would be 365 or maybe 360 to keep it a nice round number. Um, you can compound with different frequencies, and by varying the interest rate, the corresponding nominal rate, you can get equivalencies here. And this equation is not showing up very well. I use a Mac, and we're using a PC here, and it's not showing up. There's supposed to be fraction bars in here. General equation relating equivalent rates that are compounded with different frequencies. So you've got IN, that is the nominal interest rate when you compound N times per year, and you've got IM, which is the nominal interest rate when you compound M times per year. If you're going to get the same accumulated or future value, say after one year, these two things would need to be equal. And so you could also solve this equation for one of the variables in terms of the other, like this. Be a fraction here too. Think about that, that's not too hard to see. I'm going to solve for i n. I need to raise both sides to the 1 over n power to get rid of the n there to make it a 1, giving me an m over n power there. Um, evidently, we were having difficulty seeing here. There should be a horizontal line there. We raise both sides to the 1 over n power to get an m over n here. We would then subtract 1 from both sides to get a minus 1 over there and then multiply both sides by n. Again, there should be horizontal lines here, here, and here, um, showing us what to do. To solve for i n in terms of i m. And then, oftentimes you might want to use this kind of equation when n is 1 to give us what's called an effective annual rate. And hey, there's the line. It's showing up this time. An effective annual rate given i m the nominal rate compounded m times per year with n equal to 1, you can simplify this equation to this one. And just for your information, you will see this as you work on problems. The effective annual rate, when, when you compound more than once a year, is going to be more than the nominal rate. Again, that's because you're compounding more than once a year. Your money will grow by more than the nominal rate. It's called the nominal rate because it's in name only. It's not the effective rate. It's not um, measuring reality as far as what you actually get in interest. There's also something called continuous compounding. Maybe you've heard of this before. It involves the number e, about 2.71828. Let i be the effective annual interest rate and choose a number delta so that e to the delta is 1 plus i. In other words, delta is the natural logarithm of 1 plus i. When you do such a thing, when you, when you find such a number delta, it's called the continuous interest rate, oftentimes outside of actuarial science at least. We're going to call it something a little fancier sounding. We're going to call it the force of interest. And we will actually see there are some situations where it's not a constant. It can vary, but here it's going to be a constant with continuous compounding, with compound interest. Um, here's a, a side note that is something worth knowing sometimes. The following limit can be derived from L'Hopital's rule if you know some calculus, which you really should if you're in this class. You should have calculus two at least, and especially I'll just tell you, you should know a lot about geometric series. If you don't, you want to review that, especially before getting into chapter two. 
Um, the basis for calling delta a continuous interest rate is this limit fact. You can think of this expression as essentially giving you um, the future value of one uh, after one year when you the nominal interest rate is delta and you're compounding n times per year. And then let n go to infinity, let the number of compounding periods go to infinity. In the limit, you can prove this is e to the delta, which again is 1 plus i. i is the interest rate. 1 plus i has a name as well. You can call that the annual growth factor. And again, delta is the continuous interest rate, or more typically, you want to call it the force of interest. Some more notes about continuous compounding. Note that if A of T is compound interest, this is 1 plus I to the T. It's a little hard to see up there. That is compound interest. Then delta it can be thought of found another way. It can be found as A prime of T divided by A of T. Think about that. Uh, this is an exponential function. We differentiate it with respect to T. You might remember that if, if the base here is not E, you need to take the natural log of the base before multiplying by the exponential function when you take the derivative. We're dividing by the function itself. The 1 plus i to the t cancels out. We get natural log of 1 plus i, which is delta. In other words, delta is this value. And what that means is delta measures the relative, the constant relative rate of change for an exponential growth function here. A prime of t is the rate of growth. That's the derivative. Instantaneous rate of growth at any moment in time. If I divide it by a of t itself, this is called the instantaneous relative rate of growth. Take the rate of growth divided by how much you start with. Just like I mentioned before, with exponential growth, you have a, a constant, um, you can think of it as an annual rate of growth, but it's also a constant instantaneous rate of growth, as exemplified by this equation. Therefore, in the case of compound interest, delta represents the constant instant instantaneous relative rate of growth, like I just said. In other cases, non-compound interest, then, this is not necessarily constant, this quantity right there, a prime divided by a. And we can write it as a function of time. And it's traditional for actuaries to use oftentimes subscripts for the variable. They often use superscripts and pre-superscripts and pre-subscripts for variables as well. It gets a little confusing. But here, that subscript is the variable for this thing. It's going to be a function of t. It's a prime of t divided by a of t in general, which is not necessarily constant in general, though again, with compound interest, it is. Can we do anything with this delta sub t beyond continuous compounding? <clears throat> yeah, you can actually reverse the modeling process and start with a given force of interest function. A little hard to see there, that's a delta sub t. The t is kind of on top of my comma there related to the amount function by the same equation that I showed you. And interestingly enough, this ratio, this relative rate of change, can be thought of as this derivative. Think about that. Use the chain rule on this function. Take the derivative of natural log of a of t. Since the derivative of, with respect to x, say, of natural log of x is 1 over x, if you take the derivative of natural log of a of t, you're going to get 1 over a of t times the derivative of the inside function with the chain rule. The inside function is a of t, so its derivative will be a prime of t. You will get this exact same thing, relative rate of growth. And this equation can then be integrated to try to find the formula for a of t. Another way you can think about this is you can think about this as a differential equation that can be solved for a of t. You can you can think of it as dA dt divided by A equals delta sub t. There's another way to think about that, and you can integrate after separating variables to find A of t. But let's just think about it this way. Integrate both sides from, say, t1 to t2, and you get this kind of equation. When you integrate a derivative, you're going to get the function itself, right? should be familiar. We're integrating ddt of this thing. We're going to get the function itself evaluated from t1 to t2. So I plug in t2 into the function and subtract what I get when I plug in t1. On the right hand side, you just get this integ the integral of the delta sub t function. You can solve this for a sub t 
A of T2 in terms of A of T1 and delta sub T by combining these logarithms. They can write this as the log of A of T2 divided by A of T1. Then you can exponentiate, take E to both sides, multiply both sides by A of T1, you're going to get this equation. So there's a general equation relating, um, telling you what the amount function is at a time T2 based on knowing the amount function at a time T1 plus knowing the force of interest. Most commonly this is used with T1 equal to zero. And if you take T1 to be zero and you take A of zero to be one, this is a one then. Natural log of one is zero. You can solve for the natural log of A of T and then again ultimately exponentiate to get A of T in the simplest form like that. Uh, I got a new variable here, tau, that's just done, done to emphasize that in this function the true variable is this t that's in the upper limit of the integral. So I use a different variable there. Sometimes people are a little sloppy and they still use t's down there, but I like to try to use a different variable. Tau is the Greek version of t. Here's an oddball example where we can apply this formula. Suppose delta sub t, the force of interest, as a function of time is 0.1 plus 0 0.05 times the cosine of 2 pi t. Think about that for a second. <clears throat> That's going to be an oscillating function, periodic function with amplitude 0.05 and average value or midline of 0.1. We will graph this in a minute, a few minutes. And it's got a period of, of 1, right? This is going to go through a cycle of 2 pi units as t goes from 0 to 1. This might not be such a bad model. If you're thinking about just sort of general interest rates varying periodically over a given year, that's possible. It could happen at least approximately. The goal here is to find a formula for A of t and find the value of, for example, A of 1.25. I'm also going to find what the effective growth or interest rate over this 1.25 year period is and what's the equivalent effective annual interest rate in this example. What is the formula? Use the formula from the previous slide. And there you go. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's the delta sub t function with a tau instead of a t. We need to integrate that with respect to tau and then plug in the limits of integration. So we get 0.1 tau, <clears throat> excuse me, plus what would it be? 0 0.05 divided by 2 pi times sine of 2 pi t of tau when we integrate that. Evaluate it from 0 to t. When you plug in 0 in both situations, sine of 0 is 0, you get a 0 with 0.1 tau and tau equals 0. You only get something non-zero when you plug in the t in both spots. And this 40 pi comes from the 0 0.05 divided by 2 pi. So that's what the function a of t is a function of t is. And you can evaluate it at different values if you like. <coughs> For example, at 1.25, it turns out to be approximately 1.1422, meaning that over that one year and three months, the money grew by about 14.22%. What's the equivalent effective annual interest rate? I'll let you figure it out. I'll let you check this on your own. It would be about 11.22%. Maybe I should double check it, actually. Feeling like maybe I typed something wrong there. Okay, that's, that's pretty close, yep. Okay, it's about 11.22%. I'll leave that to you to try to check that on your own, okay? You can graph these things. There's a graph of the force of interest as a function of time. Here's a graph of the amount of function. It's kind of like exponential growth, but with some wobbles in it. Do you understand the relationship between these? Well, delta sub t is supposed to be a prime of t divided by a of t. At any moment in time, it's supposed to give you the instantaneous relative rate of growth. At any moment in time, say t equals 4, it would be the slope of the tangent line there divided by the height of the function at that point. That would be the value of delta sub t if t equals 4. It looks like it's close to a maximum there. When t equals 4, yeah, the tangent line is close to a maximum in slope. And dividing it by the amount gives us close to a maximum here. Actually, these slopes 
do have to be overall getting higher and higher if the relative rate of growth is going to stay periodic like this and have a, the same maximum and minimum over time because you keep dividing by bigger numbers with the relative rate of growth. Oh, take a breath. We're on to the second phase of the lecture, which I think this is shorter than the first phase. We can talk about future or accumulated value, but we can also talk about something called present value. What amount, it's, it's motivated by this question, what amount P should be deposited now as a principal to accumulate to A after T years? If you go back to the original compound interest formula, you can solve it for P, right? The original formula, I'll go ahead and try writing on the board here, hopefully, okay. The original formula that I had looked like that. We can solve that equation for P by multiplying both sides by 1 plus R over N to the negative NT power. I guess I'm using an I in here, huh? If you multiply both sides by 1 plus I over N to the negative NT power, you will get exactly this equation. Okay? So that would be, that would answer that question, how much you should deposit now to accumulate to A after T years. Thinking in terms of an accumulation function, little a of t, with little a of 0 taken to be 1, what should be deposited now at time 0 to grow to 1 after t years? Um, it should be multiplied by the reciprocal. 1 should be multiplied by the reciprocal of a of t, I should say. Instead of just saying it, I should say 1, that future value, should be multiplied by I forgot the word multiplied by. It should be, okay, or the amount is going to be the, the reciprocal of A of T. Okay, that's the amount to deposit right now. Careful, this is not an inverse function. Okay, you should, you should avoid writing something like this, though I have actually seen this in some books. I think you should avoid it. It's not an inverse function. That is too reminiscent of inverse functions, I would strongly, strongly advise to avoid confusion that you write it either like this with a negative one power or as a fraction one over a of t. That's how much you should deposit now to accumulate to one in t years. Think about it. I mean, you've got to multiply it by a of t to find its future value after t years, and the a of t's are canceled leaving you with a one. Um, in the case of compound interest, where a of t is 1 plus i to the t, we can all often uh, use different notation for this. We can define something called the present value discount factor, or just discount factor for short. Letting v equal the reciprocal of 1 plus i, 1 over 1 plus i, or if you prefer 1 plus i to the negative 1 power, we more commonly will write this present value as just v to the t. So this is the present value at time zero of a future payment of one at time t. You can write it like this, but if you let v be the reciprocal of one plus i, you can also write it like this. Some books, I should tell you, write v more like a nu. And to tell you the truth, I've heard people think of it both ways. Nu is a Greek letter that I typically write like that. Um, though in this program here, it didn't quite write it like that. V is called the present value discount factor. Some author make it look like it's a Greek letter nu. Again, I've heard people, different people call it V and call it nu. Okay, it's hard to tell the difference. This particular PowerPoint made my nu look like that. It's not a big deal. You can make it look like that. I'm more typically just going to think, call it V and write it as an ordinary V like that, and that's what I do in my problem-solving videos, if you watch those. So this is a very common notation to use. Um, you're going to see it all the time in your problem-solving, defining this and using this present value discount factor, or just discount factor for short. Um, as an example, if the effective interest rate, say annual interest rate is 10%, you can 
find the reciprocal of 1.1, V would be 1 divided by 1.1, and you get about 0 0.90909. Technically, it's 0 0.90 repeating. About, you can think of that as a percentage. You can think of this as about 90.9%. If your money grows by 10% in a year, you can think of it the opposite way. You can say the present value of an amount of one, one year in the future, is 90.9% .9 of what it is. 0.91 cents, if you will, at time zero. And in both of these situations, you can think of both of these as functions of time. So the red graph is 1.1 to the t, exponential growth. The blue graph is its reciprocal. It's about 0 0.90909 to the t. Looks like that, that's exponential decay. I also made a horizontal line here. You can see at one, for any given value of t, like t equals four, you look at the outputs of these functions, they have to multiply to one. They're multiplicative inverses. They are reciprocals of each other. Now that one's about 1 1.4, it looks like, and this one's around 0.7 something. Evidently, those are will multiply to 1. You can think of present value in terms of timelines as well, and that's also very important. Given some amount of money, A, value that some time T2, I can pull it back, and again, I think physically, I'm literally imagining pulling that back to some time T1, and I'm demoting it, and I'm making it smaller, typically, to the time equivalent value at time T1 by doing this multiplication. It's the reciprocal of the one that I had on the other slide. You can visualize it like that. That's the opposite kind of picture. So before we had A over here and we pushed it forward to time T2. Here we have A at time T2 and we're yanking it back in time to time T1 by doing this multiplication. Again, in the typical situation, we take T1 to be 0 and T2 to be Z, T. And assuming little a of 0 is 1, you effectively just take A and divide it by A of T. That's what this says to do. Okay if you take T1 to be 0 and T2 to be T. So it's just a division, typically. Or it's a multiplication by V to the T, which, again, in the case of compound interest, is this thing. This is the same as V to the T. Again, this comes up all the time in problem solving. So you really want to get used to this timeline perspective. It's very, very helpful. Um, What's the present value in general for a varying force of interest function? Suppose the force of interest is delta sub t, then it's uh, a of t to the negative 1, the present value discount function, uh, is essentially the same thing I had on the slide a while ago, except with the negative sign there. Okay? Because it's the reciprocal, it's the multiplicative reciprocal. So it's the same formula as before, except with the negative sign. And that's what the formula would be in general. And so we're going to go back to the oddball example now, where the force of interest is periodic. So once again, delta sub t is 0.1 plus 0 0.05 cosine 2 pi t. We saw that the accumulation function was that, and therefore the present value function is the same thing except with negative signs in the exponent. Um, it's the reciprocal of the previous one. And this means, for example, that the present value at time zero of a payment of one at time 1.25 is this. Taking a particular example that's related to that other particular example. And in fact, note that, remember, the one point, effective 1.25 year rate was about 14.22%. And yes, this number is approximately the reciprocal of that. Okay, you should check all these calculations on your own, by the way. You can use your calculator to check all these calculations. Again, back to the oddball example. We can graph, once again, the force of interest. And now I'm not graphing the accumulated value. I'm graphing the present value as a function of time. It's still a bit wobbly, but it's exponential decay now instead of exponential growth. Um, and as far as the relationship goes between these things, 
Um, let's see. We can certainly relate this to the original function a of t and its instantaneous relative rate of growth. Actually, I didn't think about this. Can we relate to the instantaneous rate of growth of this function itself? Let's see. Let's go ahead and spend a little time thinking about this. What would happen if I was finding the derivative of this function, a of t to the negative 1 power, divided by the function itself? It should be a negative quantity. It's, its rate of growth is negative, and so its relative rate of growth would be negative. What would happen if I did this calculation? I'm not remembering offhand. Let's just see what happens. I use the chain rope here. I get negative 1 a of t to the negative 2 uh, times, by the chain rule, a prime of t divided by a of t to the negative 1. Uh, we can keep the negatives. This is a times here. We can keep the negative sign out in front. We can, say, subtract these exponents. Negative 2 minus negative 1 is negative 1, meaning we can have an a of t in the bottom. So we do get a negative quantity, but it's the opposite of the instantaneous relative rate of growth of the accumulation function. That's interesting. Yeah, now I'm remembering that that happened. So that's kind of cool. Um, if you find the instantaneous rate of change in this function, relative rate of change in this function, take the slope divided by the output value, it will be negative, and in some, uh, it, but in absolute value, it's going to be the same as the relative, instantaneous relative rate of growth for the accumulation function. Getting close to the end here. A few more things to say. Um, there's also something called a present value discount rate. Discount rate, not discount factor. It's called D. For a given effective peri periodic interest rate, by the way, when I say periodic here, that doesn't mean it's a periodic function. I mean it's like an annual interest rate. Could be monthly as well. We can define the equivalent effective periodic present value discount rate, d, by this equation, d equals i over 1 plus i. What does this represent? This represents for an investment of 1, a payment of 1 at time 0, the percent growth in that investment relative to the future value rather than the present value. Instead of taking i divided by 1, which would be the amount of interest divided by the starting amount, we're taking i divided by 1 plus i, which is the amount of interest divided by the ending amount. Right? If you've got $100 and it grows to $110, that's 10% growth. 10 out of 100 is, a, is 10%. As far as this discount rate goes, you take 10 out of 110, which would be 9-something percent. It would be the discount rate. Uh, you might wonder why do this. Um, let me just give you a little hint that uh, you'll see in the reading, if you do the reading, that this kind of rate is often how interest is quoted, especially with bonds, whether they be government bonds or corporate bonds. They say they are selling you, say, a $1,000 bond, meaning you're going to get $1,000 in the future. They're selling it to you at a discount, they say. You pay less than 1000 to get this bond. <clears throat> That's sort of the historical origin of this idea. Uh, but it's certainly a way you can measure interest. Here are some other relationships knowing, worth knowing, relating D, I, and B. Um, D, which again is I over 1 plus I, is also equal to 1 minus V, and this calculation verifies that. V is the reciprocal of 1 plus I, so you've got 1 minus V is 1 minus this. Get a common denominator of 1 plus I. In the numerator, you'll have a 1 plus i minus 1. The 1's will cancel, leaving you with an i, which is the same as d. And so therefore, v is also 1 minus d. v and d have to add to 1. If v is that 0 0.90 repeating, that bar here means repeating, then d would be 0 0.09 repeating. They have to add to 1. Uh, it also turns out that I times V equals D, the product of the effective, let's say, annual interest rate times the uh, discount factor equals this discount rate. 
And that's an easy verification. Uh, sometimes useful to note that i minus d equals i times d. That's kind of strange. It's like id equals id. This is the id equation, okay? No psychology here, but i minus d, you can verify this, equals i times d. That can sometimes be useful. And that another thing this tells you besides the fact that these are equal is that i will be bigger than d because i times d will be positive. Therefore, i minus d will be positive, and therefore, i is bigger than d. And another equation, if you solve the original equation for i as a function of d, you'll get i is d divided by 1 minus d. And d, this discount rate, is certainly a way to represent these functions. Here's a bunch of different ways of representing the accumulation function. If i is the effective annual interest rate, it's 1 plus i to the t. If delta is the force of interest, that's the same as e to the delta t. If v is the present value discount factor, that's the same as v to the negative t. And if d is the effective um, discount rate, that's the same as 1 minus d to the negative t. And in terms of compounding more than once per year, you can use these kinds of expressions. And d n would represent the discount rate compounded more than once per year. And the present value is just the reciprocal of all those things. A of t to the negative 1 is v to the t is e to the negative delta t is 1 minus d to the positive t is 1 plus i to the negative t. And you have these kinds of relationships as well down there. So these are all different ways of representing the same functions. And you'll see in different various problems that they are all used in one way or another. And you want to. You, almost, you want to know this in your gut and just be able to use these kinds of equations whenever you need to. Final topic. I think we're going to be done in less than an hour here. And again, I've covered, in a broad perspective, pretty much everything in Chapter 1 of this book. The last topic is a little bit of a discussion about, um, um, what's the word? A little bit of a discussion about inflation. There we go. Final topic, what is the real interest rate? In the context of inflation, money losing real value, how should real growth be measured? I'm making this video in 2017. Interest on savings accounts is really pitiful, right? It's like, you know, one one hundredth of one percent per year. That's just, it's just terrible. Compounded four times a year. You know, you, you're, you're lucky if you get a dollar of interest over the course of a year. Uh, you can't keep up with inflation. Inflation is not too bad these days, but it's certainly more than 0.01%. You know, inflation, generally speaking, the prices of goods is going up by maybe 2 or 3% per year, meaning your buying power is going down over time. So if you're investing at low interest rates, you can't keep up with inflation. Ideally, you want your interest that you're getting from your investments to be higher than inflation. But if that's, even if that's true, you're, you're not getting as much money as you would hope for. The, um, if R is the annual inflation rate and I is the annual interest rate for an investment, then the real rate of interest is given by this equation. I sub real is I minus R divided by 1 plus R. Um, why does this make sense? And why is it important? Are our final issues to deal with here? Let's take an example. Say you have 100. Let's go ahead and call them dollars. $100 at the start of the year to invest. And your money grows by a great interest rate, an effective annual interest rate of 20%. 0.2. You're going to have $120 at the end of the year. But maybe inflation is kind of bad too. Maybe inflation is 10%. So that means, from a practical level that most people think of, prices go, are going up on average by about 10%. That $100 um, is going to buy something at the beginning of the year that is going to take $110 to buy at the end of the year. Buy something. At t equals zero, that takes one hundred and ten dollars 
to my at the end of the end. The inflation rate R is 10% or 0.1. So how much did your money really grow as far as buying power? People might initially think it's I minus R. 20% minus 10%. 10%. That's not quite right. Um, because 120 is not 10% more than 110. 110 is 10% more than 100. But 120 is not 10% more than 110. You have to figure out how much more 120 is as a percent of 110 to figure out the percent that you're buying power cars by. Take 120 minus 110 divided by 110. 10 divided by 110, 1 11, which is 0 0.09 repeating, I believe. About 9.09% is how much you're buying power went up by. Not 10%. And that is the same thing you're going to get if you do I minus R divided by 1 plus R. 0.2 minus 0.1 divided by 1.1. 0.1 over 1.1 is the exact same thing. About 9.09 percent. So your buying power didn't go up by 10 percent. It went up by about 9.09 percent, a little bit less. Okay, and that's the intuition behind why you need to divide by one plus r. This is really important. Actually, we won't be thinking about it much as we work through problems and talk about ideas in this book. But in the grand scheme of things, in real life. No pun intended. This is real important. No pun intended, though, but maybe I guess I was kind of intending the pun at the end. Anyway, that's it for lecture one, broad overview of chapter one. Um, again, look at the problem solving videos if you want to really get into problem solving. That is the name of the game ultimately in passing actual real exams. Thanks.